welcome to another pied uh, podcast episode uh, t- today we are talking about uh, is development just a gamble uh, as you know pied is a premier think tank and the oldest one as well we engage international and national experts uh, to talk about the range of issues today we have professor stephen with us professor stephen is a belgian british economist he has served as a chief economist at dfid and also advisor to the now known as fcdo uh, he has a vast experience field experience across many many countries which we see in his uh, writings and uh, professor steven is also the author of uh, many books and one thing i forgot to mention he is a great gambler i would say he is gambling on the idea of of development so it is a different kind of a gamble but an interesting one for now we will be talking about his latest book gambling on on, on development so professor steven first of all uh, i'd like to thank you we are really grateful for your time that you took out of your busy schedule uh, f- let me come straight t- to the point what is the basic crux of your book gambling on on development and what is inspired you to pen down this book well let me start with the with the latter part so you know the inspiration comes from you know i've been an academic for 30 years now uh, based in various places but mainly at university of oxford and you know i study as we do as economists you know economic policies actions i very much focus on rural development agriculture uh also we should do at risk and 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 safety nets and and all kinds of issues that relate to growth and broader development uh challenges now when i 10 years ago started working in the policy space you know for the uk government in uh, as its chief economist which you should think of, of of a bit like as a chief technocrat of course the expectation was that i would focus largely on these technical economic issues but one thing i learned fairly quickly is that you know it's 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 not really uh when i'm dealing with different countries and i was visiting and talking to people in government in business in public intellectuals academics and so on the the issue is often or typically not that they don't kind of know what kind of things would probably be more sensible economic policies than the ones that are taking place in fact the question very quickly becomes you know why don't countries seem to be managing to get to this kind of broad set of rather more sensible economic policies that may lead to growth and and inclusive development and rather do actually quite a few of them get stuck in equilibria that actually don't seem to be getting us uh, neither growth nor broader development now of course we have lots of theories around this um and some people would say oh you need to first build the institutions and you know and i i'm a lot of sympathy for the institutional economics um the uh, view of it but the problem i have with books like why nations fail like uh, james robinson and and deron asimoglu is it's not that they're wrong that institutions matter but the analysis is really that these things are historically shaped you know they they're slowly evolving and there is no they seem to be telling us there's not an obvious shortcut to to actually developing when your institutions are not right now when i go around the developing world even in countries that in recent times have been quite successful and my list is actually broader than the usual east asian suspects i would say of course china is being very successful indonesia has been growing its economy very quite inclusively not perfectly but quite inclusively for more than 3 to 4% per year for the last 50 years uh but you also get unlikely ones like bangladesh that actually has managed to get growth of 5 6% and also quite a lot of inclusion uh including in health and education and including for girls um in, in which structurally may not have been expected we can even go to africa to countries like ethiopia or ghana that have been doing quite well now when i look at these countries they don't have perfect institutions and so the question becomes then okay it's not quite you need to have this perfect institution to start but when you start how you get it and my big thesis of the book is really and that definitely was out of experience dealing with different government different ministries but there also different intellectuals and even people in the military and in uh, and in, of course the business community is that countries end up succeeding when in the first instance the underlying elite those people with power and influence in politics in business in the military in civil society in the um in in public intellectuals in the universities 
actually have a sort of implicit bargain, an implicit contract that actually is in favor of development and growth and actually stick to it. Don't try to undermine it. Don't, don't destabilize it. And it's not about the state leading it. You know, in Bangladesh, the state didn't lead. In Ghana, the state is not leading. But it actually is being self-aware enough. What can we do within our institutions? So don't let it ideology go above uh, pragmatism and be willing to have some form of accountability internally for the policy making and the successes and the failures or indeed externally through the political system. But these are the countries that are successful. And then unfortunately, we have countries and there I say Pakistan would be on my list where I don't think we've got that far, where somehow or another the elites are more fragmented. We can go to Nigeria, we can go to Myanmar, we can go to the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, some other African countries as well, where that elite bargain feels much more fragmented. And there isn't really that deal to do the quite sensible economic policies, because the range of policies that can be done to be, that can be successful in growth, what we've definitely learned it's a bit broader than a narrow set that maybe 20, 30 years ago, the IMF would tell us. It's broader, and, but it should be really owned and it should be really a commitment to it. And I fear that that's not quite we see in some countries. And there I say, Pakistan, unfortunately, we haven't quite seen it as well. Let me pause there to let you come back with other questions. So, Professor Steven, uh, as your book is on, on development and there have been so much talk about the development across the world, let me ask a very important question. How do you define the idea of, of development? In my book, I focus very much on takeoff situations. Places, countries that are still in low income status and try to understand that. I'm not trying to explain China today. I'm not trying to even explain Indonesia today. I'm looking really at you know, countries that, that, that may just have gone into middle income status not too long ago or indeed... Uh, that, that start in low income status and essentially that evolution, that first stage. When we're in that first stage, development will have to involve economic growth. It will have to involve growing the pie because just no society can get in a sustainable way poverty reduced without actually beginning to grow its economy and get structures in the economy that will absorb people into employment and so on. So it's not quite Dubai either, which started at a very different level uh, and with huge inequality. It's not South Africa, which is hugely unequal society, is the most unequal country, even though the GDP per capita is much higher than any other African country. That's not what I want to look at. So I would look at these early stages. But I do still look at it at basic indicators of progress, you know, health, education, but also extreme poverty, uh, incomes, and, and, and somehow a form of growth process that is inclusive as well. So it is not just natural resources and so on. So yes, we look at China and, you know, of course I'm very familiar with, with say Amartya Sen's uh, books on development as freedom, where, you know, you do need to expand the set of opportunities that people have. And uh, most societies are not perfect, not least in the early stages, but I will already say that, you know, these early stages is very important and the basic material deprivations of people matter a lot. So I focus on that. And it's it. And one of the points is also I make in the book. It's not simply about. Um, so it's definitely not simply about growth, but it's also not simply about democracy or autocracy or things like that in these early stages. The correlation between these is not so strong between uh, and between sorry between the political system and economic progress is not that strong um it has to do with the underlying elite commitment you know if you have democracy how is democracy used how is it forged and actually made makes a delivery of both growth and and inclusiveness happening if it is not in democracy how is the accountability organized so that people at least get their improvement in the living standards but once we get richer of course I am very much on the democratic side that I can't see societies keep on evolving without kind of an openness of the system as well, uh, inclusion in political freedoms as well, because we'll need an entrepreneurship and innovation at the frontier. But in these early stages, 
it is, you know, I say it with regret, it's not as crucial, the nature of the political system. It's the underlying commitment of those who have power and influence is arguably far more important. Right, Professor Stephen. Uh, let me ask you another thing, which is a bit uh, a gray area in your book. Gambling, as, you, as your name, the book of your name suggests, is a zero-sum game. But you said that the developmental takeoff is linked to the intra-elite arrangements. So intra-elite arrangements is not a zero-sum game and it is an evolutionary process. So don't you think that your idea of development is a bit shaky one and always dependent on intra-elite arrangements and the benevolence of the elites? Otherwise, we have no hope. So, so how would you explain this? There's two points there. I definitely want to take issue with you with the point of saying it's a zero-sum game. It actually definitely isn't. When you start trying to gamble on growth, it's about growing the pie. This is not a zero-sum game. The problem is in a lot of societies that we are stuck in zero-sum games where it's basically distributive politics. If I'm in charge, I will distribute to the people who supported me. If you're in charge, uh, you will distribute to the, the, the people that have. You build up states that are totally clientelist, that is simply giving rewards to the people who brought you to power, and you feel indebted to these groups. That distributive politics. Distributive politics will not give us development, will not get us growth. When I talk about gambling, it's not, it's definitely not, not like that. In fact, you know, it's about being willing to take a risk. And I will be very clear why I use that title. It's being willing to take a risk as an elite to actually move away from the distributive politics. The status quo is very attractive for those people that have power. And there's a lot of societies, and you may look, uh, you may look, uh, you may use that lens as a framework, and I will not prejudge where you could come out, but even in Pakistan, where I would say politics is seen as a zero-sum game, where the role of the different layers in society is about a zero-sum. This is not about progressing. This is about I have power and control and you don't. And that's a zero-sum game. And so I will be very clear that for an elite, that's the easiest outcomes. That's a really easy solution because you know the status quo. You know how to play the game in a status quo, in a zero-sum game context. You know exactly what to do. You can figure it out. Societies that have chosen for growth and progress, and at least also growth that is inclusive, they take a risk. The elite willing to do this, they take a risk. I'm amazed that so many elites in the world have been willing to take these risks. I'm also sad that some don't take it. So if you think of uh, Suharto in the early 1970s in Indonesia, or Deng Xiaoping in the late 1970s in China, that was a really risky gamble. Let me be clear on China. You know, up to then, you had ideology governing everything to do with the economy. You had, of course, also conflict that was really ripping apart politics and society in, in China. You had the Cultural Revolution, you had the death of Mao and the Gang of Four that actually was vying for power. And they wanted to stick to ideology as the basis for doing everything. Deng Xiaoping wanted, was worried about legitimacy to the population and losing power for the party. He gambled and got a ref with, with his group of reformers, which is not self-evident in the party. They had to slowly win this, these other elite players in the party over, that actually they needed to do something totally radically different, which is pragmatism which is, it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. That's pragmatic economic policies that he wanted. That was an enormous gamble for the Chinese Communist Party and for the elite that was controlling it. It paid off, but we know in Tiananmen Square in 89, it nearly didn't pay off. And he had to, and he did all kinds of things that I don't approve of, of course, that, uh, that was happening in China then. But it is a gamble. If we go historically to Britain, it's at various moments in time extreme events happening like conflict and other things uh, that actually got somehow the elite to be willing to actually open up politics, to be willing to open up the economy. And that was for the traditional elite. Remember that Great Britain was a feudal society where the aristoc aristocracy controlled everything. They had to open it up to the commercial classes, but the aristocracy lost quite a lot of its power. That was a gamble as well of the elite. And it doesn't always pay off for, the, for some of the elites. Some got very impoverished and lost their elite places. That's why it is a gamble for the elite. The status quo is very attractive. Why do I not focus on the people as much? Is that I would like to, and I will write more about them, but I wanted to bring home this idea that elites have blocking power. If you look at the Arab Spring, where the people rose up everywhere, 
elite capture took place and arguably the Middle East is in a worse place now than before the Arab Spring. Uh, we have to uh, think of what happened in Egypt, think of what happened in Syria, think of what happened in Tunisia, Libya, and so on. These places are in a really difficult situation now. Maybe some are better than they were before, but not many of them are. Because that's the problem is elites have the ability to capture and the ability to control. Elites love the status quo. So people, and I write in the book in the final chapters of how we can work and civil society can play a role. But elites have blocking power, and that's what I want to emphasize here. Uh, that's that we, even in democracies, elites have blocking power. Right, Professor Stephen. Uh, now let me ask you uh, another question that arises from your um, explanation. The, uh, you said that the, there will be a developmental takeoff when there's intra-elite arrangements, but the problem is, the bigger question is, how will elites arrive at a convergence point where they can take a risk uh, to uh, to take on the path of development as well as to secure their vested interests. So arriving at that point is a bit problematic. So there is no uh, clear roadmap that how uh, up such a point can be achieved. Yes. And and look, this is a little bit like you, you we couldn't have different views of, 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 of way history works, for example. And one of the and, and one of the things is that, you know, we could have a model where history progresses, you know, quite linearly, or put it simply, where it's a succession of single equilibrium in society, in equilibria in society. The problem is that somehow, when we look at the world as it is, this is a world of multiple equilibria. You know, structures and predictive things don't lead us necessarily to one equilibrium. This is multiple equilibria. And, and think of how multiple equilibria, how complicated it is also as economists for us to deal with it in society as well. Because it then becomes, um, if there are multiple equilibriums that equally could be stable, you get in a situation that it's all to do with expectations and with agency of people. People beginning to act in ways that are consistent with alternative act equilibria and getting these coordination issues in society sorted is really difficult. So this is why, in the end, these are collective action problems. Can we align people's expectations that they believe that the other elite player will play in the interest of growth and development so that I also can do it? Because if I deviate, then I will lose. Think of a prisoner's dilemma. I just will lose entirely my position. So this is a bit like we look for predictive power of knowing what the equilibrium will come. But actually in economics, we've never solved it in a multiple equilibrium point. How do you shift expectations that actually we all agree that another equilibrium is where we should coordinate on? And so it comes down to that same thing. This is why I call it also an implicit bargain, where in some sense, maybe through repeated interaction games, you start believing that the other actor is not going to be tit for tat, but actually playing in coordination. So this is a, this is why that language of the bargain comes into it. It's alluding to the multiple equilibrium world where it is really hard to go when you're stuck in one equilibrium to go to another one. And that's that's so think of you know, corruption equilibrium you're familiar with in so many countries, including Pakistan. You know, these are coordination failures. These are Essentially, why would I as a civil servant start acting differently if all my colleagues act in a particular way? How do we change that? Uh, this is not a principal agent problem, that somehow I can press a button to move the elite in a one way. It's a collective action problem. It's a coordination failure type of challenge. Professor, you mentioned in your book that the crisis-like situation across the countries can compel the elites to take on the right path of the, the development. Uh, but as we see in history and recent examples in the Middle East and other countries, that the crisis can make the countries worse off. So if we see there are more um, examples of worsening off when there's a crisis-like situation rather than a developmental path or to getting right on the track. So isn't it a bit absurd uh, or a bit confusing, uh, this idea in your book? You're absolutely right. And that's... You know, we know that the best predictor in a, in a, in a, in a regression would, of conflict would be past conflict. You know, you regress civil war on civil war and you'll get 90% R squared. So you get a very strong predictive power of conflict predicting conflict. That's what we're alluding to. But it's, of course, not a perfect correlation. And this is where it becomes quite interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll take an example, and I'm not trying to say that this is a perfect country in its development bargain, in, in elite bargain for development, Nepal. 
But in Nepal, what, they, what happened clearly with the conflict that was raging, at some point, it was actually the elite that stepped back. You know, there was the Brahmin elite that stepped back and did not pursue further the conflict. And yes, they shifted the nature of the elite bargain. It's a little bit more inclusive now than it was before. It's not as if it had a dramatic change. So, so this is the role again where, you know, you call it leadership, where leading groups, leading architects of, 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 of compromise, of deals have to come into it. Fragmentation is where it is the hardest. You know, if you have conflict and there's so such fragmentation and it's such a self-interested actors, actors, you end up in prisoner's dilemma type of uh, low outcome equilibria. But there are occasions that we overcome this. I will actually say in Bangladesh, you know, coming out of their independence war, uh, the cyclone and the famine, but also terrible economic management in the mid-1970s, arguably just a child of their time doing very state-run development, but with a state that was only just built up um, largely, let's simply say, as a, people getting jobs as a reward for their role in the independence struggle, as so many states after independence were built up, then you actually got somehow in the 1980s an elite kind of stepping back from, from doing it and allow things like, you know, BRAC as an NGO becoming almost larger than the state. And so you get these kind of remarkable things that most states would never have allowed to happen. You know, which state in the world would allow an NGO to become more powerful than the state itself? It's quite exceptional. And it's these things. It's, uh, but then it became, becomes this central role of agency. Call it leadership, but it's more than the leader. It's the group of people that actually is in politics uh, reaching out to the other groups and saying, look, we need to do this differently. We can't just doing, this. and I just, I'm, I, you know, one has to take these few opportunities one gets. Professor, I guess you and I would agree on this and many others would also agree with us that uh, there is no uh, single prescription for, for de development of the countries. Every society is unique, every country is unique. Uh, so you, we cannot say that uh, for, the de for development we, can, we should have democratic institution first and free um, market-based mechanism. We have seen the countries that do not have democratic institutions and free market mechanism also have uh, very good indicators, of, for example China. Uh, but they have a self-enforcing mechanism, a self-reform mechanism. So, uh, do you agree that every society is unique and every society has its own trajectory towards the, the, the development and every society can have its own structures of institutions? I totally buy into it, that especially on these early stages, um, you, need to, you need to be willing to be creative given your own societies and their own systems. So, so this is why I do not have this prescription about you need to have the democracy in a particular way, or indeed you have to have uh, the free market pre prescriptions in a kind of 1990s Washington consensus kind of way. That's not what I prescribe. In. However, societies and the way societies functions don't mean also that you can't just do anything. You need to find a model that actually can work, but also for the economy and for development. And a big mistake a lot of societies have made in the early stages of development is thinking, so anything goes. I can do, for example, okay, let me give a couple of examples. China is definitely an autocracy or definitely a very small elite controlling the state. But it could only do its development to having an incredibly strong accountability within its own state, within, within the own party. You know, there is strong accountability, definitely in the early stages of development in 1980s and 90s, that, that, they, that people, you know, this is results-based uh, policy making there. If you didn't succeed, <laughs> you were out. You know, we, we, it's not invented later on with results-based finance. It's, this, is, this is very much, if you don't reach your milestone, like you would typically get in a, in a World Bank or IMF program, you would actually... The, the policymaker would be kicked out at the lower level. You know, this is very, was very, very strict and it could function. Now, most states that I know outside East Asia, and I would almost say sometimes even my own, couldn't really quite function like that. You can't rely on the state to have that internal accountability because if it happens to be the brother of the, of the prime minister who happens to be uh, the chief secretary somewhere, that there is, there won't be the accountability for this piece of person, and going down as well. If he's a local link to a local landlord, uh, landowner, it won't be the case. So you have to understand that the state will not be able to do that. So. 
for many societies, state-led development is not an option because you don't have the state that is able to do that. And that would mean for quite a lot of places. And this is why I kind of admire Bangladesh. You know, the state is corrupt. The state is not very functional. The state was very weak when it started this development. But it actually stepped back and, and actually made good friends with, with, for example, IMF, but actually for a very particular purpose, because it knew that its own accountability system in the economy was difficult. So you use the, world, the, the IMF a bit like your independent central bank that actually corrects you when it doesn't go right. That was what was done in Indonesia very effectively. So you use them because you know that there needs to be accountability one way or another. A related thing is also accountability in politics. So an accountability, I don't mean it on corruption here, but just accountability for your performance. So Ghana had to move to a democracy that works quite well, remarkably well, with lots of transfers of power to actually tie the hands of the politicians that it didn't go too far. So actually, more and more evidence we have that in Ghana, if, if local MPs don't deliver for their, for their constituency, they get kicked out. So there are no vote banks really in the same way. And so the external accountability works there as well. So anyway, that's what I'm kind of alluding to. So you don't have a simple recipe, but you need to find within the space you have in your own society, a sense of what can work and not anything goes. You know, big state-led development will not work in South Asia, will not work in Africa. Big, uh, and so, so, you know, you may have to be, uh, be willing to, 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 to be more uh, based on an economy, less on connections to the state. Uh, similarly, democracy has to offer a form of accountability to performance and you need to work on this and, 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 and find a way of doing this. Um, that's definitely part of it. So it's not prescribing democracy or prescribing an ideological thing, but understand your constraints and find within it what can function and don't and be self-aware, be humble what you can achieve as a state. Right, Professor. Professor, you also mentioned in your book that in messy places where elites are a bit stubborn and rigid and do not want to take on the path of development, you suggest that the civil bureaucracy, institutions like central banks and other independent authorities should compel and should shift the incentive mechanism that elites have no option but to get on the, on the path of, of development. But how these actors and players, for example, central bank, how it operates uh, is defined by the rules of the game. And these rules of the game are very much uh, defined by the, uh, those who sit in the parliament, which are elites. So how, why would elite allow such players or institutions to play a, a positive role? How would you explain that, please? No, but, but this is a little bit where, you know, I was a civil servant for 10 years and, um, you know, you do know as a civil servant, you have a certain role to play. And so in the minimal amount is, is that, um, you know, as a civil servant, you still have the power to give advice and tell, tell, tell right from wrong, even though you may not have the power in the end to take the decision that is right or wrong. So that's the minimal amount of power one has. And the executive needs, uh, and, and Parliament and the executive, they do need the civil servants. So there is something there that I actually still believe in the kind of ability. But of course, I would be very sympathetic to the point that, you know, I was lucky to be even as a Belgian national working in the British civil service, which is definitely much more independent on many civil services that, that, that you will encounter. Um, but it's also where you begin to, to change things. OK, so because the executive is so dependent on it, and, and I have some stories here from from both from Bangladesh, but also from Indonesia, is that actually um, because the, there were a group of civil servants, advisors on economic policy, including the central bank in Indonesia, they were actually you know, very skilled. They had very close links. In fact, in this case with Berkeley, they were often referred to as the Berkeley boys, uh, that they were actually linked to it. But they played a very careful game. They knew they were civil servants and they had to follow the policy making. And often it was about cronyism and the friends of Suharto and the old elite that had to be served. But they were very good at making sure they kept up the dialogue and a, and a certain amount of independence also to the president. And they also, whenever things got a bit derailed, they used it as a window of opportunity to be very, very much strengthened their own position in it. And their own position was not about power, 
but about sensible economic policies. And so, so, so we see that actually across the, the world. And, and actually, to be honest, that's, that's a little bit how the Ministry of Finance in, in, in Bangladesh also played its role, where, where they would, you know, uh, be sensible enough with threatening, uh, threatening their colleagues in cabinet with if they went off the rails to say, you know, do you really want the World Bank and IMF to come back? And actually being being carefully playing that. And 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 doing that in an honest way because they were doing being, being putting very clearly that thing. So we also see in African countries, for example, where the support that the IMF gave to the ministries of finance and the central banks actually strengthened these institutions with better technical capability. And so the quality of analysis improved. Now, if the quality of advice improves, presidents in Africa are actually taking more, are more likely now to take some of that advice. And so we see actually in East Africa, for example, the central banks have been able to consolidate their position by giving good advice. Anything in policymaker, whether you're a civil servant or an outsider or a public intellectual or work in university, you have to take your windows of opportunity and you have to be smart enough understanding the politics. First best will never really work in the political environment in most of the countries and the state stage of uh, takeoff. So you think very carefully, what is possible within the politics? And what is actually, in terms of my advice, maybe even helping to shift the, 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 the rules of the game a little bit in favor of a bit more stable economy and a bit more better for, for a growth trajectory. So, so that's the advice I give. And I think they play the role. As outsiders, we can't do that much. But, you know, I've met so many smart civil servants all over the world in some of the messiest places. I actually have confidence that they do bit by bit. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, having seen so many countries moving more towards a growth and a development bargain in the last 20 years, I have confidence that, that they clearly played their role and that they actually managed to, to progress a bit. So, so I, I would say civil servants should never give up hope. Actually, they're essential and there are opportunities as well. Great. Thank you, Professor Steven. Uh, the good news, I'll come to the, the last um, question, uh, that any advice you would want to give the students and researchers across our country uh, in, in Pakistan, that how to take on the idea of, of development and what research domains we could have in this uh, regard. Uh, we, are, we, we are listening to you, we are all ears, if you want to say something to our youth, researchers and students. So, no, an excellent question. So I've alluded to it already just now in my answer. So, so don't only focus on the first best. So don't try to say what needs to happen is or the policy implication that we should be doing this. We, in fact, a lot of economists and academics, they love telling people what to do. Now, you have to think a little bit about better understanding what is feasible. And within the feasible set, what becomes possible? So there is a bit of, there's always research needed, including from think tanks, to finding these windows of opportunity. And where is something feasible that we can push it? Why can't we do it a little bit better? You won't get overnight grant reforms. You know, this is not... App Spring is not on, on the way, and arguably that's not the role of a think tank to stimulate it. Um, the, the, it is going to be about incremental change. So you try to think, okay, where is it that we have a window of opportunity? Rather than describing all the time how bad everything is and all the things that what should be do, done, find a sensible way of giving advice to um, people in the ministries and say, you know, the civil servants you're referring to, you know, the, the auditor general or the, or the people in the central bank, you know, what is it that we may well be able to do? Where is the wind of opportunities? And actually try to think a little bit of what are the spaces they can actually begin to act. But do it with a strategic lens, you know. If we can act on that, can it help us to be catalytic over time with some with other things to actually shifting it towards something something better? So So it's a bit like, that, that kind of, you can work on what needs to be done, but do it with a kind of understanding of the politics. And, you know, don't take sides and the, the party politics and the slogans and so on, but actually much more subtle in terms of where is it actually possible that people could act and change could happen. The second thing I would say is that it's linked to it. We focus too much about what should be done and very little about how it could be done in administrations in government. So we say, you know, we need to have a much better, we need to have an agricultural policy that stimulates yields. And 
actually the thinking of where will we now start and how can we get it implemented? And indeed, studying administrations in, in centers, in organizations, structures, how can we actually get them to deliver better? How can we help them to monitor better? How can we better help them to evaluate better? Working within government, it's actually another thing that needs to be done more because it's so easy to assume that as long as the, 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 the head of a department is told, now start doing everything you can, and here is a budget to increase yields, they're actually then making so many errors because implementation is so weak in the, in, the, in, the, in the Pakistan case. That's a really hard thing in a lot of countries, by the way, but it's very hard. And then the third thing, I think, is to really start thinking as Pakistan, so what is it that we can sell to the world? Because I really think one of the issues is with Pakistan is that with the elite bargain, it's very inward looking. And there's always, like, like so many countries that get stuck, it's always appealing to exceptionalism, that the problems in Pakistan are unique, that, that India is the big problem, that the structures and whatever it is, government and military relationship is the underlying problem. It's all inward looking. But if we look at what Pakistan seems to be really good at, is a lot of non-tradables. It's a lot of a lot of wealth gets created in in in, uh, in in Islamabad or Karachi or Punjab business elite through lots of non-tradables and input substitution and so on. It's a lot of rents to be captured. Really start studying more what's happening in Silkat. What can they do? How can we actually do it? And actually make a story that actually Pakistan is not, well, you know, can do as well as Indonesia or Bangladesh or, or countries like that in actually being outward oriented. It's a bigger market and it could live for a long time. The elite could live for a long time on non-tradables and service the sector. But actually, I think I would get, feel much more happy if I saw endless things in the shops here made in Pakistan and thing. And I mentioned that because if you are outward oriented as a business, it's in your interest to keep on pressures on the politics, that they also are managing the macroeconomy sensible, that they don't overvalue the exchange rate, that they don't run crazy budget deficits, so that actually the currency gets in trouble in other ways as well, that they may be not for an exchange to buy the inputs and so on. So you kind of get a more push for more macroeconomic stability and growth orientation if the wealth is your market and you you disentangle it a little bit more from the internal things. And so that would be the three things, you know, self-aware, what is feasible in terms of the what and thinking carefully about advice in, in to, to, to government departments, studying the how and study firm studies and so on, on non-tradables, maybe even agriculture that we could start export and so on, just to focus on them because it's, it's where I think in the end, the growth will also have to come from. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I wish you good luck with all the work. And I, I was aware of P-Day as well. And I will look up further on the website materials. And I hope to be in Pakistan sooner rather than later. We would be happy to host you whenever you come to Pakistan. Do let us know. Pied will be happy to host you. We can arrange lectures for you and other events for you. We can be resourceful. It would be good to see you again in, in Pakistan, in Islamabad, at Pied.